series call that I've been praying about all month long, but uh, I don't wonder what, what I should go with next. And this might be a shorter series than some of my other ones, uh, but we'll just see how we go. Uh, it's still kind of being developed as we, as we go. So I'm going to be talking about the promises of God, and, uh, and so uh, I'm just going to go with that, okay? So without much introduction, we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, this morning, and we're going to start with uh, uh, the book of Second Corinthians, chapter one. <clears throat> and we'll start with verse seventeen. It is therefore, <clears throat> therefore, when I was planning this, this Paul speaking, did I do it lightly, or the things I plan do I plan according to the flesh? That would mean there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. And for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sabanus and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And uh, there's a lot here. I'm going to unpack some of this as we go. Um, but uh, there's a lot in the context that I, I don't have time to go into all of it right now. Uh, Paul had originally uh, stated he was going to come at a certain time. He was delayed for different reasons, most of his body being ministry oriented and uh, perhaps some persecution. I, I, I don't have that context with me right now. But uh, so he's delayed, so he's using his own example of, and Jesus taught this, and James echoes it in his own book, there are yes be yes, and there are no be no. And there's importance to that. You know, if uh, we're talking about a faithful God, but we're not faithful, that can also, that can sometimes distort our message. Mm. That's not so much where I'm going with this morning, but uh, that's kind of the context here. At the same point in time, I think there's also another message to be gleaned from there, that, that sometimes we think that God's a yes or no God. Uh, or sometimes we think he's a, just a maybe God. Uh, when you know, uh, when we when we petition a prayer request to him, and we either think it's yes or no. But I want to highlight more uh, this verse twenty here uh, on the bottom. For all the prom, for but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen. God is a yes God. And all the promises in him are yes. And we're going to be focusing on the promises. Okay? Hope that makes sense and just as we're kind of jumping into this uh, uh, at the beginning here. And we're going to be focusing on what are the promises and uh, that are yes and amen. And why are they yes and amen? Uh, why is that so? Uh, okay? In other words, but let me just make this, these statements at the, at, at, at the beginning here. When God sent Jesus, he said yes. To all the promises. Mm -hmm. Another way of saying that with the same verse, that when God sent Jesus, he said amen, which means so be it. To all the promises. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I picture a judge with his gavel and saying, so ordered. When God sent Jesus, and through the finished work of the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, God said yes to all the promises. It's a, it, and he said amen. He said, so be it. It's an order. It's an ordinance. And it's not going to be overturned. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Again? God said yes. We're going to expand on some of this. So again, uh, here's verse 20 and uh, more clarity. For all the promises. And what, what does the word all mean? All. All. Not some of them. Not the top ten. Not the ones that God chooses at random. You know, it's not like a roll of dice. You know, uh, whatever. All the promises of God. All in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. See, the last part says, to the glory of God through us. Sometimes we overskip that part. Mm -hmm. God is glorified, or he receives glory, when we walk in his promises. God didn't just give promises, so he looks like a good guy. These are not just words on a page. This is not just some religious uh, inspirational promises. 
God, all the promises are in God are yes, and they are amen. And God gave us promises so that we can walk in them. God is not glorified when we are not walking in his promises. And we, we can't walk in his promises if we don't know what they are. And we can't walk in his promises if we don't believe in his promises. If we're still thinking that he's a yes or no or maybe God, our faith is going to be wishy-washy. But we just talked about in the last years about being established in his righteousness. We need to be established in his promises. Because they are yes and they are amen through us. And there's another part of this verse that we'll eventually get to, but uh, through us. When we know the promises of God, when we believe the promises of God, and we're walking in the promises of God, something is going to happen. And all the nations are going to be blessed. And all the families of the earth are going to be blessed because we are walking in the promises of God. The, in other words, the promises of God are not just for us, us for no more. There's a starting place in that sense. You know, it's going to be hard to minister to the others when you're struggling yourself. At the same point in time, we are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. And we, these promises have been given to us and as well as to them. And God wants to operate his promises in and through us to one another. First of all, to communicate them to them. Because they have the authority, the whole world has the authority if they receive Christ to walk in the same promises we can. But a lot of them don't know this great salvation. And so they're not walking in the promises, let alone believing in them. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, going on in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. There's two things I want to bring out here. The first part is that God, and we just talked about being established in his righteousness, so this goes right with the, that thought. But it's he who establishes us in Christ. And we need to be, and again, this is a, almost a continuation of being established in Christ. Being established in who we are in Christ. And it's God who has established us. When we came into Christ, or when we received Christ, we became established in his gospel. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, one thing you're going to see me do, I'm going to be using the word promise and gospel and covenant kind of interchangeably through, the, through today's message anyway. Um, and we're going to see the, 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 the connection. But when we, be, when we came into Christ, we, as far as God's concerned, we became established into the gospel. The reason I say it that way is because if we don't know it, if we're not established in it, if our minds are not renewed to it, we may not be established in the gospel, although we're in Christ. That makes sense? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are walking that way. A lot of people are, are not, that's their Christian walk. But as far as God is concerned, when we are in Christ, all the promises of God are yes in Him. And if we are in Him, then all the promises of God are yes to us. That makes sense? Yes. yes, yes, yes. But the last part of this uh, verse that I want to focus on for a moment is that who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, I'm going to focus a little bit on the Spirit part and, and a, little, a little bit down the road uh, in a few minutes. But uh, God, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. What I want to focus on here is that the seal of the Spirit is our guarantee that He will complete what He has redeemed. Or in other words, saying that he will complete what he has started. He started it when we received Christ. But when we received Christ, he had, and let me go back to this verse, he had established us in Christ and has anointed us in God. And he who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our guarantee, in our hearts as a guarantee. In other words, we, his Spirit is our seal, is our guarantee. That he will complete what he has promised. God has promised something. God, the promise is not just coming to Christ, even though that's the greatest aspect of the promise. And I'm going to bring that out in just a minute. But in this, in this 
relationship that we have in Christ, there is a promise and his spirit that he's given us is a guarantee that he who he is faithful to finish what he started in our lives. He redeemed us so that the promise can be fulfilled in us. That making sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, I thought I took this out, but we'll go here anyway. Um, at the, uh, all right, take out two of the verses. I didn't take out this one. But uh, early on in the chapter, in the same chapter, since we're here, Paul had already been talking about God will, God had, uh, let me just read it. <coughs> God who delivered us from so a great a death and does deliver us and whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Uh, the reason I took it out because I just didn't want to go this direction right now. But ba Paul had already been talking about that God has delivered us he does deliver us, and he will still deliver us. When you study out the words soteria, sozo, for salvation or saved, it includes the, the, the definition of the being delivered. <coughs> a point I was going to make is uh, our salvation is past, present, and future. We are saved. We were saved. But we are also experiencing salvation. And we will continue to experience salvation. Just because we receive salvation, just because we receive the promise, doesn't mean it just stops. This salvation is supposed to be a lifestyle. And God, who has delivered us, will continue to deliver us. That goes with what we were just saying. His Spirit is our guarantee that He will complete. He will bring into fruition what He has started. Mm -hmm. What He has redeemed. What he has promised. There's a verse in Philippians that says, He who he is faithful to I think it's Philippians 1 6. Let's go there real quick. I'm going to my notes for there. Since I brought it up, it's a quarter right. It's been a while since I think it's Philippians 1 6. I know it's Philippians 1. Just one second. Being confident, now we're going to talk about this confidence in a minute too, of this very thing that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. God will fulfill what he said he's going to do. It goes with our theme verse for our own lives is that delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you desires of your heart. Commit your way to him, trust in him, and he will bring it to you. God, we're going to be talking in a minute, too, about this promise being a seed. And this seed, its purpose is to gestate and grow and come into fruition to be fruitful. God has a purpose in us, and that purpose is Christ. And we don't just have Christ, so we have, like I said before, a fire insurance to go to heaven and not hell. That is plenty profound, and I'm not watering down that at all. We all want to go to heaven and not hell. But that's not the whole message. Amen. God has also delivered us from, from sickness, from the curse of the fall, from poverty, from division, from all kinds of strife and, 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 and the symptoms of the curse. I mean, God, God has planned to give it his life so we can have life and life more abundantly. There is a purpose why God created us. And we are to fulfill that purpose. Does that make sense? Yes. And that, 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 that we have a promise to fulfill the purpose of God in our lives. Our salvation, and this was my point I was going to make, is past, present, and future. Like, I guess I didn't take them out because they're still here. Um, but anyway, uh, the, same thing, the same point I was just making in 1 Corinthians 1 10 says, uh, and Paul echoes it in Galatians 1 4, it says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us? from this present age and according to the will of our God and our body. God is delivering us. Okay? Um, and then it's also kind of echoed here in Romans 8, 31, 32. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And he who did not spare his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Mm -hmm. The greatest miracle of all is that he hath delivered us from the power of death. But it doesn't stop there. God did not just deliver us from the power of death. He has given us a salvation that we can experience life. And if he did not spare his son so that we can have this life, how will he not also give us all things? Amen. That is the promise of God. That's what I'm trying to communicate right now. That the promise, and I'm not taking away from this great salvation, but I'm trying to include the whole salvation package. I want the whole thing. You know, yeah. it's like if you ever go get something, you know, at the, at the maybe a fast food drive through get home and they forgot your fries or they forgot a portion of your meal. Yeah. I want the whole thing. Yeah. I want what I paid for. Amen. Now, we didn't pay for the salvation, but Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And we want everything he paid for. And he did not spare his own son to give us his... Great salvation, how will he not also give us all things? God is not holding back on us. The devil is a liar and a still a thief. He's out to kill, still destroy. If we are not walking in the, the promises of God, there's something, either we're missing it or the enemy is robbing us from it. And some of that robbing is just that we don't know who we are and we don't know how to obtain it. And we are to walk in the promises of God. They're a yes, and they are an amen. And that is our authority. We don't need any other authority. Amen. The word of God says it. It's established. And if, if what you're thinking is saying that you can't, you can't, you, you're not worthy for it, then that's the wrong message. I don't know where that's coming from, but that's not God. Because God has already delivered us. He's already established his promises in us. They are yes, and they are amen in him through us. That make sense? Okay. I'm going back to Corinthians. Uh, we already did know that. I think I was just repeating myself here. Excuse me. Sorry. I'll repeat it again. The seal of the Spirit is, is our guarantee that He will complete what He has redeemed. Okay? For all the promises of God, all, I like echo that, all of the promises of God are yes. I'm sorry, all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Okay? And again, I just want to echo these again. I think that's why I put them in here again. God gets glory when we walk in his promises. Mm -hmm. That's the first point I'm really just trying to establish it right here. And when we came into Christ, we became established in his gospel and his promises. And the seal of the Spirit is our guarantee that he will complete what he has promised. That's the key thing. The seal of the Spirit is a guarantee that he will complete what he has promised. Okay. Uh, you guys good? Okay. Let's move to Galatians. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read uh, verses 8 to 12 here. Five main scriptures I'm going to use this morning. This is the second one. Okay. But Paul, Paul speaking again in Galatians 3, he says, And the scripture, and we already talked a few weeks back about the testimony of scripture. Uh, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify or declare righteous the heathen. I love that part. The scripture has foreseen that God would justify the heathen. That gives me encouragement because we all qualify. Amen. Okay? We are all qualified as heathens. So, uh, nobody is disqualified from this. Like the scripture has foreseen that God will justify or declare righteous the heathen through faith. And we're going to be talking about that right now a lot. God would justify the heathen through faith. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham. Gospel was preached to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And what did the gospel that was preached to Abraham say? In thee, all nations be blessed. Amen. So then that they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The gospel 
was preached to Abraham, and it said that to thee, and we'll expand on this in a minute, to your seed, singular, all the nations will be blessed. Okay, we're going to expand on that. Okay? The gospel is established, but I want to make this point, the gospel is established by grace, but is released by faith. You can't earn the gospel. You can't earn his grace. You can't earn his promises. You can't earn his covenant. You can't earn salvation. It's established by grace. But it is released by faith. The promises have been given to us by grace. But they are released by faith. Amen. And we're going to draw that out. We're going to see that through Abraham here. We're going to see that through some of the other patriarchs as well. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. That's, that's a mouthful right there too. If we're trying to trust our performance, the Bible says we are under a curse. Mm -hmm. Okay? For it is written, curses in every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified or declared righteous by the law and the Son of God, it is evident. For the just or the righteous shall live by faith. That's a key phrase. I mean, we, Paul quotes that about three or four different times. It comes from the book of Habakkuk. But the just shall live by faith. And the law is not a faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Faith is not a movement. So people talk about the grace movement or the faith movement. And there's other kinds of movements. Faith is not a movement. Faith is a lifestyle. The just will live. And we have been justified by his grace. Amen? Mm -hmm. We have been declared righteous by his grace. Yeah. But the just, the righteous, shall live by his faith. Paul said it this way in the book of Acts. In, in him we live and move and have our being because we are his offspring. And faith is how we live. We have been justified by His grace. We've been established by His grace. But we live by faith. Faith in what? Our faith? No. So many people are putting their faith in their faith. Putting their, which is another way of putting their faith in their performance. Mm -hmm. And we just read that when you do that, you curse. If we live by our performance, or by our works, we're cursed. I didn't say that. The scripture said that. Yeah. Paul said that. But we live by putting our faith in His grace. We live by putting our faith in His promises. That makes sense? Because I'm going to be using grace and promises interchangeably as well. If we are going to receive what grace has asked to offer, then we must live by faith. Yeah. That makes sense? Yes. Grace has already made the offer. The promises of God are yes and they are amen through us. We must put faith in the promises. We must put faith in that he has said yes and amen to the promises. That makes sense? The communication of your faith becomes effectual when we acknowledge every good thing that's in us in Christ. Finally, in verse 6. Grace has already made the offer. We can't earn it. God has established us in grace. God has established us in his gospel. God has established us in his promises. He's already declared it is yes and amen. But if we're going to choose to receive it, we must live by faith. And just live by faith. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curses is everyone that paineth on the tree. Now, we quote this verse a lot. This is verse 13. And I love this verse. And he has redeemed us from the curse. And how did, how did he redeem us from the curse? And we talked about this at length and before. He redeemed us by the curse by becoming the curse for us. Amen. He became the curse. And, and if you read this in context, let me read these verses together. For Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hated on the tree. And actually, if I could just take out this last uh, uh, 
part real quick. Uh, for Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, Amen. which is us, mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. He became a curse for us, so that the blessings or the promises or the grace of Abraham might come on us through Jesus Christ. That making sense? Mm -hmm. Now we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And we have, there's, a, there's a lot here, so I'm going to take the first half of this. He, Jesus, became a curse for us. So that the blessings, the promises, the grace of Abraham might come to us, who are Gentiles, through Jesus Christ. So that the, we might the promise of the Spirit through faith. There's a lot here. <laughs> and there's two different things he's saying. They're, they're, they're supporting one another. But let's look at the first half. He became a curse for us so the blessings of promise that we have might come through us through Jesus Christ. It's the same verse, that, it's the same concept that we've read many times in my favorite verse, where he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. To be the curse for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That we might receive the blessings. That we might receive the promise. That we might receive... What is the promise? The righteousness of God! That, and, and there's more to it that, that comes with that that we're going to be expanding on. But He became our curse so that we can become His righteousness. He became our curse so that we can be blessed. With the blessing and the promises made to Abraham. Jesus crucified our sin. Jesus crucified our curse. He crucified our sickness. He crucified our poverty. He crucified anything that's associated with the sin and the curse that comes with that. Hallelujah. We're going to be looking at some of that in just a minute. And he crucified all this so that the blessings of Abraham might come on us through Jesus Christ. That is huge. So when God sent Jesus, all the promises of God are a yes and amen. amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Going back to Corinthians, for he made him who knew no sin to be sent for us, that we might become the righteous God in him. Well, he became our curse. He became our sin, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through Faith. Okay? In other words, Jesus took our curse. He took our punishment. So that we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. Does that make sense? Yes. This is who. If we understand everything that he's saying, he became our curse. So we could not, if he did not become our curse, we could not receive the promise. Amen. If he did not become a curse, we would have nothing to put faith in. That's right. We are all men most miserable, the scripture says. Okay? But when you believe in Jesus, the Spirit of Christ comes to live on the inside of you. That's huge. When we receive Christ, when we believe in the gospel, when we believe in the promises, when we believe in the gospel of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of promise, the seed of Christ, the seed of promise comes to live on the inside of us. It's not just a badge. It's not just a, 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 a stripe on, on, a, on a sergeant or a lieutenant. That's what I was kind of referring to. It's not just a badge. Jesus comes to live. On the inside of us. Receiving Jesus is the greatest aspect of our salvation. That's huge. Because if we have Jesus, we have the promise. Amen. We have the seed. We have the healer. We have the provider. We have everything He is and living on the inside of us. That's why Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. There's a lot here, but the word faith keeps coming back up. 
Okay? When we receive Jesus, we receive Jesus in the greatest aspect of the promises of God that are yes and amen to us. Mm -hmm. If we have, that is the greatest gift. But in this seed, in this Jesus, in this promises, is more than just a status. It's a life. And we can change the world upside down. And there's something, there's, there's a whole package that comes with this Jesus. You know, we're getting into Christmas season. A lot of stores, a lot of people will be offering bundles. Well, there's a bundle that comes with this Jesus. There's a bundle that comes with this promise. Mm -hmm. There's a bundle that comes with the salvation that we receive. Healing, wholeness, salvation, deliverance, etc. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay? We live by believing we already have his life. We live because we, we believe we already have his nature. We, uh, we believe we already have his health. We already, believe, we already have his blessing. And again, it's not just a status. We have been born again with his nature and everything that he is. We live by believing we already have Jesus, the promise seed. Now, when you have the seed, even if you were, and when you have the seed, you, it, you have everything that that seed has to offer. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Even if you were have, have a drought, and that seed does not die, it will grow again. It will restore. It will replenish. Okay, the time of year when people will prune their rose bushes soon, if they haven't already. And it looks like, you know, I remember the first time we got roses and we, we spent a lot of time uh, here in the house in, your, in Redlands, California. And we spent a lot of time fixing up that flower bed and different things. And we spent days and days. We even made a manhole for a while to get some of the old mulberry roots out. And we finally we planted some roses and whatnot. And we were so happy. Every day we're like, there's another, there's another rose, there's another rose, there's another rose. They were blooming all different kinds. We're happy, happy. And then one day Sherry came by with her shears and cut them all off. <laughs> and I'm like, you mutilated it. You killed it. What did you do that for? It was so beautiful. Right? She did, then she gave me the lessons of pruning, what that looks like. And then a few months later, in his time, they were even more beautiful than ever before. Yeah. This is not a message about pruning, but the seed. And we have a promised seed, and in this seed is a bundle, is a package of things that we can be experiencing in this life if we will believe in Jesus and the promises that we receive. Make it this? The promises, these promises are established by His grace, and they are released by faith. All the promises of God are in Him, yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Okay, go back to Galatians. Now to Abraham and his seed, seed being singular, were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds, plural, as of many, but as one. And to your seed, who is Christ. The promises the promise, our promises, was made to Abraham and his seed. The main point I'm trying to make right now is that the promises were made to Christ. In a sense, they were not made to us directly. They were made to Christ. They were not made to Ab uh, natural Israel as seeds of many. I'm going to bring this out in a minute. They were made to Christ. Okay, true Israel. I bring that out. This whole lot. It's going to take me a little bit to get there. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant or the promise that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. In other words, just even in the natural sense, if a, co if a covenant cannot be changed by adding to it or taking away from it, then God's promise to save people by faith in Christ cannot be affected 
430 years after the promise. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is the promise, the gospel that was preached to Abraham, the promise, the gospel that was preached to Abraham was preached 430 years before the law. The promise was given first. The gospel was preached first. We think the gospel was preached in the New Testament. No, the gospel was preached before the law. And if the covenant and a, and a, and a covenant can't be annulled, it can't be changed, it can't be added to, it can't be tweaked with. And if the covenant and the promise to God to save people by faith in Christ, because the promise was made to Christ and his seed, it, it, cannot be, it cannot be affected by a law that was given 430 years later. That's huge. Mm -hmm. The main point I'm making is nothing can annul the promise of God. They are yes and amen in Him, Christ. Because the promises of God were made to Christ. And in Him, the, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him through us. Amen. That's huge. Mm -hmm. The law cannot nullify the promise that was given before the law ever existed. That's huge if you, if you can grasp what I'm trying to say. The promise to save people by faith in Christ was made 430 years before the law. That's huge. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of the transgressions. Till the seed, Christ, should come. To whom the promise was made. The promise was given before the law. Has greater authority than the law. That's a major point I'm making right there. The promise was given first, therefore the promise, the gospel, the covenant, has greater authority than the law. Is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all understand that the promise by faith in Christ and Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is huge. I'm telling us why it has to be by faith. Because if it was not by faith, then it has to be by works. That's huge. He establishes the promises by grace, but it is released by faith. If it's not released by faith, then the opposite would have to be true. We'd be released by works. Yeah. And we would all fail. Yep. Does that make sense? Yes. And yes, so, yes, yes. the scripture has come out all and said that the promise is by, by, faith, by the faith in Jesus. That's why the promise was made to Christ. Because therefore, it is infallible. That makes sense? That's huge. And that's why all the promises of God in Him are yes and amen. Through us who believe. And the promise. What's the promise? Christ. When we believe in Christ, the seed, the promises of God are yes, and they are amen. So be it. I can put faith in something that is absolute. I can put faith in something that has more authority. I can have put faith in something that is established and is concrete and it, it is supreme. That makes sense. I can trust something that is unmovable, unshakable. And cannot be annulled. The promise cannot be voided by our performance because the promise was made to Christ. That's huge. No matter how many times I failed, no matter how many times I messed up, His mercy is new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. And if I fell 70 times 7 in one day, his mercy is still there. But there's nothing we can do to void the promise that has been made to Christ. That's why I said the promise wasn't made to us directly. It was made to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now we are beneficiaries. I'm going to tie in how we're beneficiaries of that. But it was made to Christ. Because if it was made to us directly, then we could void the promise. <coughs> but Christ had already finished the work. 
And we have been born again of the promise seed of Christ, which Peter calls the incorruptible seed of Christ. You can't corrupt something that's incorruptible. That makes sense? Yes. So we can trust that. Now, I want to switch gears here for a moment. This is my third main passage of Scripture I want to go to. I want to go to Deuteronomy 28. If I had time, I would read the whole chapter, the whole chapter because, and it's a long chapter. The first 14 verses talk about the blessings. The last part talks about all the curses. I like reading both, usually. Why? Because all the promises of God are yes and amen through, again through us. And I like knowing what promises have been made to me. But I also like reading the curses. Why? Because I like to see what I've been redeemed from. Amen. That makes sense? So if I'm experiencing something that is in the curses, then that tells me I need to re, re, uh, be reprogrammed and be re, re, renewed in my mind of that I don't have to put up with that That's right. because I have been redeemed. Amen. That makes sense? Okay? But we're going to look at the first 14 verses. Uh, we're going to look at the blessings. Now we'll start verse 1. It says, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now let me just read a space. I think something we've been kind of saying all, all, all along. Christ has already obeyed the law. Christ has already fulfilled the law. And we are in Christ. And we're going to bring that out in a minute. And uh, my next, more of my next point. You're going to bring it out. So, because Christ has fulfilled the law, all these promises are us. Are ours. That making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse, uh, so, G in other words, Jesus is the condition of the new covenant. Amen. He's the condition. Because the promises were made to him. The covenant was made not only to him, but by him. He cut the covenant with God. Where I, where he was our propitiation. Okay? But it says, All and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. I love that. We shouldn't have to pursue the blessings. Mm -hmm. Amen. They should be pursuing us. Yes. And if they're not pursuing us, then there is a disconnect. And it's not God. And it's not the promises. Because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Him through us. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yes. So something, either the devil is stealing our promises that are ours, and you can't steal something that's not yours. Mm -hmm. But but the problem, the law, is that all, and it, again, what does the word all mean? All. All these blessings shall come upon you, not just some of them, not just a few of them. It's not multiple choice. All of these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Jesus obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. When we believe in the gospel, we are, we are receiving what Christ has obeyed. I'm not, I'm not trying to write down to, to connect all those dots. And this is... This, this, these are the promises that will show God will come out because of the colon there. And it says, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Amen? Whether you're in Chino or in Upland, you're blessed. Right? Amen. Out of the country or out of the city, you're blessed. <coughs> blessed shall you be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your heart herds. The increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. You know, I don't care whether where the revenue is going to come through. Whether the revenue comes through the government because you're retired or, or it comes through a job or investments or a second job or, or multiple streams of income. You are blessed. The fruit of your body, all of your produce, all of your increase is blessed. Okay, Blessed shall be your basket, your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be your refrigerator, your storehouse. Everything you got is blessed. Blessed shall be you sh shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Mm -hmm. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. And they shall come against you in one way and flee before you in seven ways. Amen. 
That's awesome. The Lord, your God, the Lord will command the blessing on you and your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand. That reminds me of Psalm 19, verse 17, when Moses says, The beauty of the Lord of God, God is upon us, and he will establish the work of our hands for us. He will bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Just as he has sworn to you, or promised to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. And they shall be afraid of you. I'm going to focus a little bit more next week on the name of the Lord. The promises are associated with that. But this is not just something that God's going to bless you on the backside of the desert. It is going to be an open display of God blessing you so that all the nations of the earth can see that you are blessed by the name of the Lord. Amen. It will be a testimony that there is a God and He is alive and His promises are yes and amen. Not just so you can boast in yourself, but you can boast in His glory so that they can say, I want what you got. Amen. We are not... It's one thing that we talk about the grace of God and the gospel, and our lives are just as miserable, if not more, more miserable than theirs. That that doesn't that doesn't sell very well. <coughs> the people should be coming to us. I want what you got. Amen. They might debate with us on some theology, but they can't debate our testimony. Amen. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods. In the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. <coughs> the Lord will open to you his good treasure. <coughs> the heavens to give the rain to your land in the season. And to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. That's awesome. That's right. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall be above all me and not beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of these commands, but you command you this day to the right or to the left, to go after the other gods to serve them. I know there's a lot here, I'm not going to have time to break down each promise or each blessing here, but we are blessed. Amen. All the promises of God are yes in Him, amen, to the glory of God. God is glorious. God is glorified when we are walking in his promises. God is not glorified when we, everything that Christ has provided for us, and we don't appropriate it, God is not glorified. That's Christ true. paid dearly That's true. for the promise to establish the covenant. And the only thing we're going to get out of it is fire insurance? No. I'm not, I'm not debating that. That's going to be awesome. The, the, most, the most horrible thing could be ever that you go to hell and not heaven. But at the same point in time, there are people who are living in a mere hell on this earth. Mm -hmm. And we are more than conquerors to him who has saved us. Amen. We are the people of God. And God has brought us out of Egypt into a good land. And we should be experiencing that. And part of the good land was that they were to drive out all their and how we into the land. We need to drive out sickness. We need to drive out poverty. We need to drive out division. We need to drive out things that are not of God. His house is to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. I wish I could have time to tie all that in and all that. For by grace you have been saved, through man. That not of yourself it is a gift of God. The same thing for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes in the Jew person also believes. We receive grace, a promise by faith. For by grace you've been saved through faith. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. We receive, the, the, what I, again, what I'm trying to echo, the promises are there. Mm -hmm. They're ours. Mm -hmm. They've been established by the cross. They've been established by Christ. But we must believe. We can go all of our lives without experiencing the promises of God if we don't believe the gospel. 
I'm not just talking about the time that we set the sinner's prayer. Not that there is such a thing. But, uh, but, uh, but, but I'm not trying to mock that. But, one, but the moment that we receive Christ, we are to experience salvation every day. And we, the, the, we don't just receive faith one We just don't have faith one time. No, the just and righteous live by faith. Yeah. We live by trusting Him. So that the promises can be fulfilled in us and to us. Grace is not automatic. We receive it by faith. Amen. The promises are not just automatic. That's right. They are ours. But we have to receive it. I have money in the bank. But if I don't use the card, if I don't write the check, if I don't use it, it can sit there all day. It can accumulate interest. Although it's not very much. But it can just sit there. And the bank is making all kinds of interest on it. Amen. We won't get into all that politics or economics. But it's not automatic if I don't use it. You know? Uh, there's so much we can do. We have a purpose. We have a destiny. But it's not automatic if we don't appropriate our purpose. When we have a consent. Hebrews 4, 3rd, 3rd, 1. Third place in the way gets you. Probably the short, the shortest of the four. But we and go to the context of Deuteronomy because we're talking about the promised land. Deuteronomy 28, he's, he's talking about when you get into the promised land, these are the blessings that will overtake you if you keep my commands. Therefore, since a promise remained of entering his grass on the promised land, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. I want to stop there just for a moment. The God, Paul had already said that the gospel was preached to Abraham. The writer of Hebrews is saying that the gospel was preached to them mm -hmm. in the wilderness as well as to us. Mm -hmm. The gospel had been preached before the law. Okay? But the gospel was preached to us as well as them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. That's huge. Mm -hmm. They heard the gospel, but it didn't give them, it didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with faith. Amen. That's sad. We can hear the gospel and it not profit us because we don't mix it with faith. That's that's huge. That's sad. Okay? But all the promises, all the promises of God and Him are yes and amen, and Him amen to the glory of God through us. We need to mix it with faith. An entire generation of Egypt, that came out of Egypt that saw the Red Sea, that saw all these miracles that were delivered, didn't even get to enter the Promised Land because they didn't have faith, except two men, Joshua and Caleb, who Moses writes. A different spirit. Okay. Um, well, that makes sense. You can hear the word and it not profit you if it's not mixed with faith. You can hear the gospel. I have a word missing there. You can hear the gospel and it not profit you if it's not mixed with faith. You can hear the God promises. And it's not, and it's not, and it won't profit you if it's not mixed with faith. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. The promise is that God has already established the grace. He's already established the gospel. He's already established us in the gospel. He's already established the promises, but we must activate them. Mm -hmm. I trust Him. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. We can't earn them. We can't. Uh, it's grace. We can't earn it, but we can appropriate. Hopefully I'm making sense of that. I think I'm missing some things. So if I don't come across it, I'm going to go somewhere else and just say it. Therefore, Hebrews 10 says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which was great, was which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. What is the 
will of God will. And a few verses later, God, the writer Hebrews says, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes in God must believe that he is and that he is rewarding those who seek him. We must seek him, and I want to go back to this verse, with confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. Sometimes when we don't see the promise fulfilled, we don't see the manifestation, many of us have given up hope, given up confidence. Um, see, they heard the gospel, but it didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with faith. What, what was the scene here that all this took place in, in Hebrews 4? If you study it out, this is when they sent the spies into the land. God didn't tell them to send spies, but Moses did it anyhow. And ten of them came back with an evil report, saying, we can't do it, because there's giants in the land. And they felt like grasshoppers in their own eyes. But when you, but it said Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. They, Joshua and Caleb chose to believe what God has said. If you read it out, back in Numbers chapter 33, and in the context, God had already told them that there was going to be giants in the land. God had already told them that uh, uh, the circumstances, but God told them that the victory was there. God had made a promise to them that they would be victors. That make sense? Mm -hmm. And then, although they heard the gospel, it didn't profit them because they didn't mix it with faith. Mm -hmm. And because they didn't mix it with faith, most of the people lost their confidence in what God has said, what God had promised. And so an entire generation missed the promise. They got to come out of Egypt, but they wandered in the wilderness. Their, their children, the second generation, entered the promised land. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. What's our promised land? Someone posted that on Facebook just a a few weeks ago. What is your promised land? I believe our promised land is to fulfill what God's called us to do. In one sense. Our promised land is to go into a land flowing with milk and honey. Our, our, plan, our promised land is, is enter into his rest. What has God promised us? We each have a destiny. We each have a purpose. Um, I think the promised land is more than just what I said. But it's all that God has promised is entering his rest. He's brought us out of Egypt to bring us into the promised land. Everything, I believe the promised land, in many ways, is, is very allegorical. Christ saved us, not just so we wander in the wilderness for uh, 40 years, never entering into the promised land. Mm -hmm. When they were in Egypt, they were promised to go into the promised land. The promised land was not the, dwell the wilderness. Now in the wilderness, they they had they had they had quail burgers. They had manna. They had manna till they were tired of manna. I mean, I mean every week, Sharon and I go, what, what, "What meal do we want to make this week?" And we had some good meals, but both of us, after forty years of eating the same meal, we're gonna get tired of that. You don't want it no more. And they have their clothes didn't wear out. You know they had. They had the, the first air conditioning system by day and the heating system by night. They saw some miracles. And they were living from miracle to miracle because they were wandering in circles from day to day. <coughs> but the, uh, they were living in tents. <coughs> I like going camping. I like being in the tent. <coughs> Been out for 40 years. <coughs> Not all the time. No, we, 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 one time uh, we put the tent in there, Lake Juma, and we weren't thinking when we put the tent because we were on a hill. And we didn't realize till nighttime that whoever slept on top rolled down to the bottom on the bottom. <laughs> and we switched it a couple times, and, and someone always ended up on top. And so we had a funny. Uh, we moved the tent in the morning, but we didn't want to move it at night, so we had to barricade in between us, so uh, <laughs> the person would not roll down. It was one interesting night of sleep, let me tell you. I, I felt like I was up. watching uh, I Love Lucy in one of your episodes, you know, but uh, just anyway. I don't know how I got into all that. 
But the the wilder, God provided for them supernaturally through the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't the promised land. That's right. It wasn't what God had promised. It was and 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 the only and I don't know why. Yeah, I'm getting it out here. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the from the beginning of our of our confidence steadfastly, steadfast to the end. While I said today, if you would hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. When we hear His heart, if we harden our hearts to what we hear, God calls it rebellion. Amen. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt? Was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, those who course fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would they would not enter into his rest? They would not enter into his promised land. But to those who did not obey. Deuteronomy says that we will have these blessings if we obey his commandments. Here he says they did not enter the promise like they did not obey. What was the obedience? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. When we do not believe the gospel that was preached unto them, the, uh, two verses later he's going to say the same gospel was preached unto them, but it did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. When we do not believe his gospel, when we do not believe his promises, that is disobedience and that is rebellion. There's going to be one reason why we, there's one reason only why they did not enter into the promised land was because of unbelief. That was the only sin. It wasn't the, the idol that they made when they were given the Ten Commandments. It wasn't any other sin. It was one sin only, and that was the sin of unbelief. There is one reason, and one reason only. You will not experience the promises or the grace that God has for you to its fullness, and that is because of unbelief. Amen. That's huge. It is. That's how Abraham received the promise, was by faith. That's how we will receive the promise, by faith. And that's how they did not receive the promise, was because of unbelief. That's huge. Paul, I mean, the right Hebrew calls it rebellion. God calls it rebellion, witchcraft. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But it is rebellious to not believe the promise of God. There's one reason, one, one reason only why we will go to hell. is because we don't believe in Jesus. And that is rebellion. When we don't receive Christ, and when we snuff that, or we reject the sacrifice, we reject the provision, we will go to hell. Those who reject will go to hell. I'm not going into all that right now, but is that making sense? Yes. That's the ultimate promised land. But there's one sin and one sin only why we don't go into the promised land if we don't want to believe. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has been, I go back to Hebrews 10. Mm -hmm. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, where you have need of, your, of endurance. But after you have done the will of God, you will, you may receive the promise. Andrew, in his commentary uh, on this verse, talks about confidence. I just want to read something real quick from Andrew. He says, confidence is a very powerful force in our lives. It is possible to believe something and yet not have to be confident in that belief. We only get the full benefit of our faith when we believe something so strongly that we are confident. That makes sense? Yes. But that's huge. We had to let that sink in a little bit. But it's not, you know, I can believe, I can say I believe something, and I might be very honest about that. But am I confident about it? Mm -hmm. It takes belief to another level, mm -hmm. another depth. That makes sense? Yes. You know, uh, and so, and sometimes our worry, we are more confident about the things we're worrying about than we are about the things that we believe. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. One of them is more dominant. One of them we're very confident about. And we need to be confident in the promises of God. We need to be so established that we're going to stand in His promises. And we're going to be like Joshua and Caleb. 
I don't care if you stone me. I believe we're going to go to the promise. Because they learned to stone him. Yeah. We're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I will not bow. Like Daniel, he can throw me in the lion's den. And whatever the case may be, I will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, again, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, but you have need of endurance. We don't always like this word. Endurance, patience, so that afterwards you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. We first have to believe, then act, and then be patient before we receive the full manifestation. We don't like that word patient. It's called the P word. Okay? But we must, but just think about it. We must first believe, then act, and then be patient before we receive the manifestation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this real quick before I finish my last two points. We're almost done. But the ones that fell, this is the parable of the seller, and Jesus makes a statement. He says, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who have heard the word of God. I wish I had time to tie some of these words back in together. Because you kept hearing this word, they heard the word of God. And the, 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 uh, the Israelites, they heard the gospel, but it didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. But the good ground is those who heard the word of God with a noble and a good heart and keep it and bear fruit with patience. You see, we can only bring forth fruit with patience. When you think about farming or gardening, you plant the seed, you water it, you nurture it, but in patience for it to come through. You can't expedite it. You can't make it grow faster. You have to be patient. Mm -hmm. The Word of God, we need to take the Word of God. We need to take the promise of God. We need to chew on it like a cow chews his cud. I'm not trying to be gross, but we need to chew on it. We need to be disciples there. We need to chew it in the way so we become confident with much endurance and much patience. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? I mean, I've I mean, I heard so many testimonies from people who needed healing. And so they find all the scriptures on healing. And they chew on it. And they chew on it. And they digest it. And they digest it. And they stand on God's word. And they stand on God's word. I'm going to get healed. I'm going to get healed. I'm, and they chew on God's word. They're standing on God's word. What are they doing? They are enduring the promise. And I, I'm all for it. We can have instantaneous miracles. But sometimes we must sow that seed. And we must water that seed. And we must fertilize that seed. A mother who's pregnant is going to take care of her body in a different way during that pregnancy. She's going to go to the doctor and find out what she should eat, what she should not eat, what she should do or not do. She's going to nurture that, and she's going to endure some things. <coughs> but there's some things that we need to endure so we see the promise. They were told that they would, they would get the promised land, but they were also told that they were supposed to drive out the enemies. God was going to send hornets ahead of them. God was going to fight the battle for them and with them, but they had to pick up the sword and they had to go do something. Grace is not automatic. We must apply faith to it. And faith without works is dead. We're not putting our faith in our works, our performance, but there is a corresponding action to our faith. Amen. That makes sense? And when we believe, we will act correspondingly. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, talks about by faith they did such and such. By faith they did such and such. Noah built the ark by faith. I mean, here Noah built in a boat. Not on the seashore, but in the mountain. And it had never rained before. And it wasn't just a little hobby. He built it for years. Being mocked, ridiculed. They never rained before. And even if it didn't rain, they wasn't gonna, how was it going to float? But by faith, he built the ark. We have all kinds of people in the, in the Old Testament. By faith, he did this. By faith, he did this. And all of them did it by, and how, how come Noah built the ark? Because he heard the word of the Lord. And he put faith to it. How are we going to have faith if we don't have a relationship with God? We're not in his word. We're not spending time with the Father. Jesus did nothing without spending time with the Father. 
But when Jesus was very effective in his ministry, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. He had time with the Father. He spent time with Him. Am I making, am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And, and with that, there's a corresponding action. Sometimes we might look, look ridiculous. But if we know that we know that we know that we know we hurt God on the matter, that settles it in our hearts. And by faith and confidence and endurance, we will see the promise. It's not our performance. It's our faith in that word. That had a corresponding action. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Go to Romans 9 as we conclude. It says, Who are Israelites to whom pertain to the adoption of the glory of the covenant, the giving of the law and the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and of whom, according to the flesh, Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. There's a lot in here. I don't have time to go into it at all. But in this, Paul talks about Israel. At first he's talking about natural Israel here in a sense. And he talks about different things that are, that are given to Israel about their adoption, the glory, the glory of the covenants, the, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. I wish I had time. I don't have any time to do all this. But I can connect how all these attributes are, are described about us to true Israel. And I don't have time to go through them all, but I made a little list here based on Romans 9 4. We are chosen by God. We are a royal priesthood. We are accepted in the beloved. We are adopted into the sonship as a spirit. We are anointed. We already read that this morning in 2 Corinthians 1 22. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing, which is the covenant. We are instructed by the law. Um, uh, and we are also a half, half service when we day 11. And we all promises. We're going to spend more time with Second Peter 1 in a, in a few weeks from now. I'm going to spend some time with that. Anyway, I don't have time to go into all this right now. But we, these are all attributes of us, too, here in the new covenant. And these are all new covenant scriptures that validate this. I can give you just a list later if you want it, okay? okay. Um, but going back to Romans chapter 9, verse 6, it says, But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed mm -hmm. shall be called. Not all of Israel is seeing the benefits of the covenant. Now, I want to make it, I know there's some promises made to natural Israel, we do see them blessed. And we were talking about this last night. Uh, I don't want to go a lot of depth into all this. But they believe who they are. They trust who they are. And they are a blessed nation. But, in the, in the scriptures that we're reading, true Israel is not natural Israel. True Israel is spiritual Israel. Mm -hmm. Because the promise was made to Abraham and his seed. It was made to Christ. But, but even naturally speaking, it was not made. Uh, we're going to get into this. Abraham had two sons. Ishmael and Isaac. Okay? And not all Israel are seeing the benefits of the promise. Not all Israel... Not all Christians are seeing the benefits of the promise. Mm -hmm. They don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. so they're not established. Yet. Okay? Isaac is a seed of promise. We're going to see this in just a moment. It's also talked about, he, Isaac is, it talks about him being, in the race of him being the son of the spirit, not of the spirit. Ishmael is also described as the, the law. He comes from Hagar, who represents the law. We're going to see some scriptures about this. And it also talks about him being the son who's born in the flesh. Okay? Isaac is born in the spirit. Ishmael is born in the flesh. Scripture, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to look at this in a second. Galatians 4 says, I'm going to come back to Romans 9. It says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by the bondmaid, Hagar, the other by a free woman, Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman, Hagar, was born after the flesh. 
the he of the, the free women was by the promise. Which things are an allegory. All of this is an allegory of two covenants. Okay? Mm -hmm. The one from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, which generated to bondage, which is Agar or Hagar. Well, this Agar is Mount Sinai, again, where the law is given in Arabia. And answer to Jerusalem, Sarah, which is, we talked about in our last teaching series a while back, but Jerusalem is Mount Zion. It's the church. It's the bride of Christ, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. Ishmael is in bondage. Jerusalem is free. Which is the mother of us all? That's a whole mouthful, too. I'm not going to go into all that right now. Verse 28. Now, we, brethren, and who is we? We. So when he says we, brethren, that includes who? Us. us. Okay. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. In other words, we are the children of promise, just like Isaac was. Because mm -hmm. the promise was made to his seed, and it was made to Christ, but it was also made naturally to Isaac. That making sense? Uh -huh. And again, we already read how these sons are an allegory of two covenants. That makes sense? Uh -huh. And we're talking about the covenant of promise, and we, in, in context, we're looking at the other covenant of Ishmael. But as then that what was born after the flesh, which is Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, which is Isaac, us, even so it is now. Yes. I, I, I have a whole teaching on this. I, I don't have time to go into all this right now. I can run it in uh, one or two of my books that I've written. I mean, that's why we see all the turmoil in the Middle East today. But I even have another teaching how the, Ishmael's the older son. He persecuted the younger son, Isaac. Mm -hmm. I have a whole teaching. We see this with Cain and Abel. We see this with Isaac and Ishmael. We see it with Jacob and Esau. We see it with uh, David and his older brother, Eliab. Mm -hmm. We see it with the prodigal and his older brother. We see it with uh, uh, Jesus and the Pharisees, or, or the, the Pharisees and the, 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 the younger spiritual children, the publicans and sinners. We see it with, uh, uh, there's a number of examples I have that I use this for as well. But we see the same, the, old, the, the, the one who's born in the flesh or the older son persecuting him who's born in the spirit, the younger son. It's not about older and younger so much, but I see this parallel throughout scripture. Okay? <laughs> it's, it's usually a, re, a religious mindset that's persecuting uh, those who are born in righteousness. Mm -hmm. uh, I have all teaching on this. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go into it. But Paul makes even so it is now. Moving on now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? <clears throat> Cast out the bondwoman, Hagar, and her son, Ishmael. For the son of the bondwoman, Ishmael, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Of the son of promise, born in the spirit, Isaac. So then, brethren, we, and who's we? Us. We, us, are not children of the bondmen, of the bondwoman, but of the free. Amen. We are children of the free. We are children of the promise. That makes sense? Yes. There's a whole teaching here. I don't have time to go into all the detail that we see here. Going back to Romans chapter 9, though. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. Ishmael is not Israel. Mm -hmm. They will not be partakers of the covenant and heirs as Isaac. Nor are they children because they are seed of Abraham. Ishmael is not, that's why there's a lot of turmoil in the Middle East and different things. It's all about the birthright. It's all about the promise. That's why there was problems with Jacob and Esau. Why there was problems with Isaac and, and, and Ishmael. It was about the birthright, about the promise. Because the promise was made to his seed. But it was made specifically by God to Isaac, who we are. We just, we just covered by that. We, when it's talking about Isaac, it's talking about us. Amen. It's talking about the seed of promise. Okay? And we are called. Okay? Natural Israel seeds plural is not the protector of the promise. Only the seed singular. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
This is a, again, Paul makes the makes the that this is an allegory. We're not talking about particular people. Okay, right. I have a whole teaching I can expound on all of that. But Isaac is not Abraham's. But make, this is an important point. Isaac is not Abraham's firstborn, but he was the promised son. This, this point's going to come out in just a minute. Likewise, Abraham's true children are not natural descendants by natural order. But those who have those who are children of Abraham are those who have received the promise. Okay? And we're gonna, there's a word that's going to come out by election. Okay? It's going to come out, uh, I think, in the next set of verses. That is, those who are of the children of the flesh, speaking of Israel, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Singular. Which is Christ. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Speaking of Isaac. Speaking of Sarah. Uh, Sarah. Natural, again, natural Israel is not the protector of the promise. Only the seed of Isaac. And not only this. But when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, not having, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works of him who calls. In other words, I want to focus just as we kind of close here. Paul in parentheses is saying that the purpose of God according to an election might stand, not of works. But of him who calls. Now, I don't, I don't have time to get into the whole doctrine of election uh, that Paul teaches. And that's where some people think that God has predestined people to be saved and everything. And I, I don't have time to repeat all that right now. But the purpose of God will stand, not by the works, but by grace. It's not by a natural order, by being the natural firstborn, which will be the normal way that the See, no, normally, the, math, the firstborn will receive the inheritance, will receive the promise. God didn't do that with Isaac. Mm. And God didn't do that with Jacob. Both of them were elected. Both of them were chosen. Why, how were they chosen? By grace. Amen. It was not by works. It was not by natural order. It was, in other words, they didn't earn it. It was by grace. Amen. It was by election. That's where I'm going to focus with this. Okay. Those who were considered the children of Abraham were not natural descendants by natural order, but were chosen by God, by His grace. It is about His grace. It's not about performance. Does that make sense? Now I can tie this in with natural Israel. If they are born of Isaac's seed, I can tie all that into that. Okay? But they're not Ishmael. Not through Ishmael. I'm not going to go into all that, but I just thought I could make a disclaimer about that. But we're talking about, but Paul, uh, I think I missed the verse a while back, but if it's not, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up here in just a minute. It was said to her, <coughs> Rebecca, that the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I have my love, and Esau, I have my hate. I don't have time to bring this all out. Lawson has a powerful message about this. How he talk, he, remember I talked about how Isaac represents well <coughs> Lawson will talk about how Isaac represents grace and Ishmael represents works he also will talk about how Jacob rep represents faith and Esau represents unbelief mm. and he has a more bigger revelation on that and this statement was actually made in Malachi several hundred years after Jacob and Isaac were born. This was not made uh, before they were born. This statement about Jacob and his love, he's not hated. Lawson Purdue brings out how God loves faith, but he hates unbelief. And we've already seen that with some mm -hmm. scriptures. Okay? But the purpose I want to make right now, in closing, is that the purpose of God will stand, not by works, but by his grace. Mm -hmm. The grace of God is immovable. We cannot, we cannot nullify the grace of God by our performance because the promise was made to Christ and his seed. 
it was not made to us. So by our works, we cannot nullify the promise of God. We've already made that point. Does that make sense? Yes. And so it's by an election. It's by grace. And therefore, that's why we're making the statement. The purpose of God, the promise of God, will stand. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Him by us. But we must put faith in His grace, mm. not our performance, not our natural breath. We are born again of Christ. We're not born again. Uh, let me make it sense. Mm -hmm. Those who were considered the children of Abraham were not, I mean, I'm being repetitive, not just in this, but were chosen by God. It is without His grace, not our performance. If you want to receive the promises, you must believe them. They are yours. Um, one other scripture I want to bring out here. I didn't, uh, must got a race. <clears throat> if I go to, um, in closing, Galatians 3.29. This is an important scripture. I can't believe it got a race. But, uh, it says this. If you be Christ, and ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. That's huge. If we are Christ, then we are heirs according to the promise. We are not, we, if we uh, so, I should have brought this on early on, so I'm bringing it, bring it up now because I missed it. But if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. We are, uh, we are according to the promise. If we are in Christ, then the promise is made to us. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yes. And we're not made heirs because of natural order. We are, the promise was made to his seed, through Isaac, not uh, Ishmael. Natural order would have been Ishmael, being the firstborn. But it was by election. It was by grace. Mm -hmm. It was chosen. Mm -hmm. It was made to his seed. The covenant was chosen by God. And uh, um, so that Isaac couldn't say, I earned it. I didn't earn it by natural birth. I didn't earn it by anything. I received the promise by grace. Isaac was chosen. And the seed was, the covenant was elected by God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by, Isaac did nothing by performance. He did nothing by natural inheritance to receive it. He received it by grace. That's huge. You gotta let that sink in. But it's not by performance. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All the promises of God and Him are yes and in Him, Amen, to the glory of God by us. Hope it doesn't make sense. But uh, and we'll get into some more things in this, in this next few weeks. But. God's grace has established the promises. It's our faith that releases that promises. We need to know who we are. We are Christ. And so therefore we are, we can inherit the promises. We are, and because we are Christ, we are Isaac's seed. We are Abraham's seed, according to promise. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. It's not by performance. It's not because we've earned it. It's not, uh, we can't earn it. See, Ishmael represents the law. <clears throat> Ishmael represents trying to earn the law. Uh, all I know, know, know uh, what this was, well, uh, with a little commentary. Remember when the scheme of things orchestrated by um, Jacob's mom. But Jacob basically took the, the blessing. Whole con artist scheme that he did, being dressed up in hairy arms and whatnot, and made his father's favorite uh, meal um, and whatnot. But when Esau realized that he had lost the birthright, he had lost the blessing, he was angry at his dad. And there's a scripture, I forget the reference now, but he, he said because he was so angry, he, he left his father's house. And he went and found a daughter in Ishmael, a daughter of Ishmael, mm -hmm. which his father had forbidden. It's something that his daughter did not want. He did it in rebellion. But uh, the, the daughter that he married, her, ma her name, if I recall right, was Mathala. I might be pronouncing it right, but Mathala. That's the best way I 
I can do with her right now. And I remember, you know, a few years ago, back in 2009, 2010, I was looking, I would just, not, every once in a while, I'll look up something just to find out what it is. And I look up her name, and her name but in Hebrew means sickness. Mm. And uh, that's, that was interesting. Because it says, cast out the woman and her son. Hagar represents the law. <coughs> Ishmael represents persecution. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to draw all that out right now. But Ishmael's daughter, her wife, uh, uh, means sickness. And I, and I when I used to teach him with this, that we can, I can tie sickness right back into this law, this persecution, just by using the names. And we're to cast out the, the bond woman and her son. Which I believe also would include any offspring that came from that as well. <coughs> and so, uh, actually, Ishmael, it was Ishmael's daughter who was with Allah. Anyway, I, I just say this in closing. Because we read in Deuteronomy the promises of God. What we didn't read is all the curses. And most of those curses have to do with sickness. Mm -hmm. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And we don't have to put up with sickness. We don't have to put up with anything that's part of the curse. We only have to appropriate what are the promises of God. They should be overtaking us, but we need to trust this gospel. Mm -hmm. We need to trust what his promises. We need to appropriate by faith. <coughs> As Paul, in that last scripture that we were reading in Romans chapter 9, he actually, if you study it out, he actually uses six different things to illustrate this whole election that we were trying to burn out. He uses Isaac and uh, Isaac and Ishmael. He uses Jacob and Esau and some others to say that we cannot earn it. We cannot earn God's grace. We cannot earn the promises. The promises were already made by covenant to Isaac. We need to believe and know who we are. Not all Israel is Israel, but the true Israel is those who have been born of the seed of promise, which is Isaac. And Paul says that if we are Christ, then we are of Abraham's seed, and we can inherit the promises, because the promise was made to Christ. In him, in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And the, in other words, if we, if we, Aiden and I said today, the promise was made to Christ. And because we are Christ, the promises are yes and amen. Christ fulfilled that. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, in other words, Paul is using the Old Testament to teach the gospel. Mm -hmm. To validate why we, all the promises are yes and amen, and why we can receive them by faith. The same way that Abraham received them by faith. Mm -hmm. Lord, we worship you. We magnify you. Lord, I hope we are making sense in the Bible. Now I have it, Lord. I just pray that you make, make it clear. But Lord, this is not just a theological message, but Lord, this is supposed to be, we're supposed to walk in the promises of God. Lord, uh, Lord there's so many promises, not just so we feel good and our lives are all put back together, that's part of it, but Lord, we have a purpose and we need to reach people and people need to be set free. And uh, well, we need to put out the bond woman and her son. The, the ministry of condemnation, the persecution, sickness, anything that would come against the people of God, it's time for us to cast that out because we are not, we are not of the, the, the bond woman, but we are of the free. And we are free. And he who the son has set free shall be free indeed. You have given us precious promises. And they are yes and they are amen. I hear in him through us. And we worship you, we glorify you, we magnify you. Bless this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.